the art of self-reliance is forging your own path, but the path is difficult. Made easier by learning from those who have succeeded in directing their own lives on their own terms. With their help and inspiration, your path to self-reliance moves from dream to reality. And now, here's your host, Dr. Rodney King. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Art of Self-Reliance show. In this episode, I speak to author of Stop the Break, Janet Barrett. Together with Janet, we explore how she went through life believing she was resilient until she finally broke and found out the hard way what achieving real resilience means. Janet now combines her personal story with rigorous research to help audiences understand how to move from surviving a life to thriving and catching fire. In this episode, we explore proactive mental health care, emotional Sherpa versus resilience, and how your trauma can become a story of triumph. The art of self-reliance calls you to adventure, to develop your self-protection skills, to learn how to survive no matter where you find yourself, and to thrive amongst life's chaos. You know, this is this is my first question for you, Janet. It's a question I ask everybody, like every guest, same starting question. When you hear the words self-reliance, what does that mean to you? So for me, self-reliance is how I went through life for a very long time where I relied only on myself as opposed to using other resources that were available to me. And I learned very young that I I didn't have really strong adults in my life that provided the support that I actually needed. So I learned that I needed to be able to do everything myself. And so I took all of that on and felt like I could only rely on myself. So when I think of self-reliance, that's the first thing that comes to mind. However, that has evolved in the last couple of years for me, where I still have that natural tendency to only rely on myself. But now I've learned to use other resources around me to give me better tools to be much more effective in my self-reliance. And sometimes those tools are other people. Sometimes they're skills that I have developed. Sometimes they're you know, processes that I can go through. Um, so to me, that's that's how it's evolved for me from being something where I, only I control everything and I figure it all out on my own to now I use the resources around me. Very interesting. When you were talking there, I could place myself back as a child, because my experience growing up was, was quite similar. I grew up in South Africa on the south side of Johannesburg in government housing. So the only way I could describe that for, say, a non-South African audience is like the projects in the United States. So I grew up relatively poor. And as is the case with all those kinds of neighborhoods, you know, it's an impoverished neighborhood. There's breakdowns in the family, the gangs on the street and so forth, right? So, and, and similar to you, I couldn't rely on, on any of the adults in my environment. My mom was a abusive, raging alcoholic. So I learned really early on kind of similar that I had to rely on myself. And over the years, and this is what we're going to talk about, right? Through lots of different paths and different avenues and, you know, learning, I've come to that point like you have where, I'm no longer in that place, although I can if I need to, I can go back there. But I realize that true strength and, and true development as a person can never be achieved on your own, that you have to have the right people around you. Right? So that's part of, I guess, the, the thing that people have to figure out and then utilize them in a way that is effective to you, but always remembering to give back. Does that kind of make sense to you? Absolutely. Yes. And having the belief that you can find the correct people was one of the hardest things for me because I kept choosing the wrong people for a long, a long part of my life because I was still going back to some of those adult figures and still trying to, you know, win their affection, win their love, get them to be the person that I wanted them to be. And I would select people that reflected their same approach. 
And it took me a long time to learn those one, are not the right people for me. And two, to trust myself to realize now you understand that and you can find the people that are the right ones to support you in your journey. Yeah. And then you find that, and this is what I what I found, was that you you don't necessarily realize, especially as a child for sure, but you do later on in life, hopefully, that a lot of those people and the the kind of the pressure or at least the influence that they place on you 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 take that on you become that right and so when you do start growing up and especially as i got out of the house and i was out you know out on the street so to speak i would gravitate still to those kinds of energies and you know in hindsight looking back i wish i knew that right but i didn't and so i ended up exactly as you were saying hanging around the people that I pretty much shouldn't have. And there was no way that I ever would have got to where I wanted to get to by being, you know, part of that group. Yes, absolutely. And I did the same thing. And I think it's very common to do because it's what you're comfortable with. It's what you know. And we always gravitate towards what we know as opposed to going to an uncomfortable situation from an experience standpoint, even though it might be better for you. I mean, that's the battered wife syndrome that if, you know, you don't have something that you can comfortably go to, you will stay in those relationships that are not healthy for you and not good for you because it's it's unknown and the unknown is scary. There's also that aspect of conditioning, which is what one of the realizations I had is that you get conditioned into it. You know, it's 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 the, becomes the status quo for you, and so that you know you defaulting to it not just because of what you said, which is a big part of it, but also because you conditioned into it. Like for example, when I think about myself, the way that you dealt with problems when I was growing up was pretty much one way. If you could, you use violence. Violence is the way that you dealt with any problem. There's no talking in my neighborhood. <laughs> There's no sitting down and having a communication session where you would communicate with each other, work things out, and then come to some agreement at the end, right? It was always about using your fists. And so that was my experience. And then, so of course, you know, once I got into so-called everyday life, like out of my neighborhood and moved away, that's the only thing I knew. That's the only way that I knew to express myself. And it took me some time to realize that how much of what I was doing was because I was conditioned to believe that that's the way that you resolve any kind of conflict. And the way that I was taught, the way that I became comfortable was you just hit everything. You ignored it. You pretended like it wasn't there. And you made a facade for people to see. And I had a whole bunch of different ones, depending on who you were, what portion of my life you were in, you saw a curated front of my being. Nobody ever saw the entire thing because I learned very early on that nobody really believes it. Nobody wants to know about it. Nobody wants to deal with it. They're just like, just, just be quiet. If you are quiet and fit in this nice little box, then you're accepted. And I just wanted to be accepted. So I did. I hid the traumas that I went through. I hid the emotions that I felt. I hid everything. And honestly, I kept doing that until I was almost 50 years old. So it wasn't something that um, when I went out into kind of the real world on my own, that it didn't work because it did work. And people still like to have people fit in a nice little box. They don't come up to you and say, hey, how's your day going? And expect a real answer. They expect you to say, oh, I'm fine. How are you doing? I mean, at most, we might joke and say, oh, it's, you know, everything's so crazy busy. I'm doing all of these things because somehow that's a badge of honor. But we don't ever really tell people what's going on. And so my coping mechanism was extraordinarily successful for a very long period of time. Sounds familiar, right? So I hid my trauma from my childhood and I used it as fuel to drive at becoming successful. And I, you know, I still am, I guess, but I mean, for a long time, most people knew me as a very well-respected martial arts coach. I traveled the world. I, I mean, I've been to probably more countries than most people will ever be able to go to. So I've been very fortunate. So I've taught everywhere and I would show up put on this facade, this persona of what everybody expected expected from me and expected me to be, even though behind that scene, I was completely falling apart. 
was completely stressed out and struggling with my mental health, but I never showed it. And it, in a similar way, it was only in my 40s, actually, where I started to come out and talk about it publicly. I actually started doing that firstly on my blog. And then I started speaking about it just openly as I continue to teach, which I still do. It's part of the other thing that I do. So it just shows you that, you know, you can almost get to, you know, past the mid middle of your life before you even get to that point where you're actually going to be honest with yourself. And what I can say for myself, and I'm not sure what it was for you, but it was extremely scary to go out there. I was very fearful to put that on the table, right? Because I really didn't know how people were going to take it. It is scary. It really is. So very similar, uh, but I had an event that happened that completely broke me. So I, you know, pushed through and pushed through and pushed through and pushed through. And then in 2019, I found out my husband was having an affair and wanted a divorce. And it shattered me. It absolutely shattered me. And the thing that was hard for me to understand was why did that event break me? And it was because I had never dealt with my mental health. I just kept layering everything on. I call it being an emotional Sherpa. Mm. And I was an amazing emotional Sherpa. I could carry a whole bunch of stuff and just keep plowing forward. And this was literally that straw that breaks the camel's back. That's what it was for me. And so in going through the recovery from that, that's when I learned, you know what? Your trauma response for decades is not going to help you now. It's really not. And I had to become really, really honest with myself and went through a period of building my life back up, understanding how to do that, what worked for me, what didn't. And when I started to tell people about it, I always got the same reaction, which was, oh my gosh, one, I can't believe that, that you had that going on because I was, I was the same thing. I was a very successful professional. I traveled the world. I did all of these things. I had four beautiful children. I had an amazing house, you know, everything you could think of. If you were to check those boxes of, you know, what is being a successful adult, I could check the boxes. And so they were all very surprised but then I would get a lot of direct messages saying, that's me too. And the more I talked about it, the more people opened up and I realized they're having the same issue I had, which is nobody else is like this. I am the only one. I am clearly a broken individual. I need to just shut up and push through because I don't know what's wrong with me. And I don't know that I really want to know what's wrong with me. And it wasn't until I had that break that I had to figure it out and I had to delve into it. And so now, having gone through that, dealt with a whole bunch of stuff, I feel actually oddly comfortable talking about what I've been through. And as somebody was asking me yesterday, they're like, isn't it triggering for you to do this? I said, honestly, no, because I've now dealt with it. And I dealt with it in kind of an, a unique approach, I guess. And I'm like, now it doesn't trigger me. It still makes me emotional, but it's not one of those things that it shuts me down or you know, makes me unable to go forward or feel like I have to suppress it. One of the things that I realized was that when we talk about this idea of does it trigger you, the reason it triggers people is because they don't want to go into it. Yes, they haven't dealt with it. They haven't really released that weight that was, you know, that they have been carrying around. And until people release that in whatever way works for them, I don't think that you can really not be triggered by things. Janet as well, which I think is really important and it speaks to what you've just been saying. There is this, how can we describe it? When people think about mental health and people struggling with their mental health, they often feel like, well, if somebody is really struggling as badly as they say they are, then they should be the kind of person that's crawled up in their bed, can't get out of their bed, can't do anything. It's a myth. 
the reality is, and just like yourself, I mean, for several years when I was struggling with deep depression, I was on the road all over the world in front of people I'd never met, teaching some of the best seminars I have ever taught, right? I was doing my job the best I possibly can. Everybody told me that it was the best that they'd ever been to, but behind the scenes, that wasn't the case. And so I think there's a fallacy out there that, oh, if you're struggling with your mental health, it means that it's only true that you can't get out of bed in the morning. They don't realize that actually there are many people that excel, at least in what society says you should excel at in order to be seen as, you know, being great. But behind the scenes, there's a whole lot of struggle going on. So there's two things that when you were talking about that, it reminded me of one before I actually broke, I was, I was really struggling. And I said to someone that was a partner, I said, you know, I, I think I need to get help. I really think I need to get help. And sadly their response to me was, well, do you want to kill yourself? And I said, well, no. And they're like, well, then you're fine. And I still go back to that. And one, the fact that that was the bar that they had in their head that I had to be at in order to get help is terrible. And what's even worse is the fact that I felt bad that I wasn't bad enough. I literally took more stress on myself thinking, you know what? You're right. You're not that bad. It's not that bad. And I've said to so many people, because they'll talk to me about their issues that they're going through. And I, I try to help them them through that. And they will say, oh, well, that's a first world, world problem. They're correct. It is. But it's also their problem. And they need to be able to deal with it because it doesn't matter what your problem is. You still, it's part of your life. You still need to figure out the best way to handle whatever is in front of you. And then thinking about you talking about the successful people, I think the most successful people that are out there are the biggest emotional Sherpas in the world. And I've talked to a couple of people that have worked for companies that had CEOs that ended up having breakdowns and going and getting help. And they're now very public about it. And I said, that's great. I love that. But why didn't they talk about it before then? Why didn't they talk about it before they hit their break? And so one of the things that I try to talk to with people about is being proactive in their mental health. So I've had a couple of people say, well, what does proactive mental health actually mean? And I said, well, think about your physical health. Do you go to the gym? Do you eat healthy? Do you, you know, take walks? Do you, you know, do whatever you need to do to keep your body running in a healthy way? Not everybody does, but most people do something or they at least recognize that it's important for you to do that. Like that's being proactive. That's doing something before you have a problem. But we really never do anything proactive for our mental health. And to your point, most people have such a stigma around getting help for it that we will hide it as much as we possibly can. I did for decades, just like you did. And I want people to start saying, no, I want to do something proactively for my mental health. And, it, you know, I think therapy is a great thing. I don't think therapy is the right answer for every person. I think there's a multitude of avenues that people can take in order to be proactive with their mental health, to find something that helps them deal with their stress and their trauma, their anxiety, their depression, whatever it is. It might be medication. It might be physical exercise. It might be, you know, therapy. It might be journaling. There's a whole bunch of avenues out there. And one, I think we wait until people are broken for them to get help. And two, I feel like the majority of people say the only solution is for you to go into therapy. And therapy is expensive. It's there's not enough therapists in this world to help everybody that needs it. And if we d stop people from breaking, that might not be the only path that we can take. When you say proactive, I like that. I think the reason is what well, at least one reason why we are not proactive is because it's really hard sometimes to know how bad things are actually right. 
It's like you, you like you were saying, I felt you felt guilty that you weren't at that bar where you had you were feeling suicidal. So then clearly things can't be that bad, right? And I think that's part of the problem is that it's not easily quantifiable where if I'm not looking after myself and I start eating, you know, junk and I'm just not looking after my diet very, very soon, I'm, if I want to, you know, I can deny it, of course, but very, very soon when I look in the mirror, I'm going to realize that something's not right. I can see it, right? I can see the change in my body. So the change is that motivator then to say, okay, I'm going to do something about it. But when it's internal and it's just something that, first of all, Nobody else can see most of the time unless you're showing it. And if you were like people like us, we were very good at hiding it. So you wouldn't see it. And then we also, it creeps up on us, right? It builds, it's like layers. And eventually it gets to the point where it's a tipping point. And the tipping point too is also very different for one person to another. So I was thinking about that. I was like, why did I have my tipping point when I had it, which was much later on in life? Well, I think the reason is, is because how I grew up, as I described earlier, made me very good at dealing with bullshit and problems and all the stuff that comes with life, right? So I was initially able to deal with it quite effectively. It may not have been the best way to deal with it, but I still dealt with it. But later on in life, eventually it got to the point where it piled on to that point that I could no longer handle it. And then there was that tipping point. So I think all of these things I just described as part of the problem and the reason why so many people are not proactive. So one of the things that I would love to have people do is I think there are warning signs. And I think each person has warning signs for when they're starting to get out of balance mentally. The tr challenge is um, figuring out what those are. Because it's not, you can't run a you know a lab test and say, oh, you have high cholesterol, or you know you have high blood pressure. You there isn't a great lab test for anxiety and depression. You have to self-diagnose, and so I think understanding what your warning signs are is critical. So I actually have listed out what my warning signs are because. I do have, I still, obviously, I still have life going on. Things happen to me, even though I have dealt with things in the past, new things come on and I will avoid them. I will try to pretend it doesn't exist, but I know what my warning signs are because I took the time to try and figure out what they are. Some of them are really silly. Um, like I won't let myself stand in the shower and just relax for a minute and enjoy the hot water on my body. I will get in, I will get out, I will move on, I will just keep going and doing and doing and doing and doing. I um, won't go for walks with friends. I will only go for walks by myself. Little things like that, if I start to see myself doing them, I proactively call myself on it and make myself sit down and say, okay, what is it that you're avoiding? What is it that you're not wanting to do? What is it you don't want to deal with? And make myself deal with it. And it's hard. I don't like it. I really don't. But I have found out that if I don't, I'm going to end up in the same situation that I was in. And I really don't want that. And I really enjoy my life so much more when I have dealt with those issues than when I have suppressed them. And knowing how much better life can be is the carrot that I'm going for. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've seen what life can be like and how much more I enjoy life and can actually be present for the things happening in my life that I wasn't before because I was pushing so hard to get through that um, it. I think that if people were to sit down and do those warning signs, it would be really, really helpful for them. And then I actually keep mine posted um, on my computer because I'm on my computer all day long. And as a, a visual reminder that, you know, if this is happening, you need to do something about it. You shouldn't just ignore it. I love that. That's, that's really great. I was thinking, as you were saying that there may be a starting point might be from people when they think about becoming more proactive in their own mental health would be self-awareness, spending time to be more self-aware of oneself is a key, I think, to what you've just said, because 
that was incredibly important for me. So much so that I realized how important it was that even as I was going through my dark period, which is kind of ironic, I was actually doing a PhD in mindfulness. So I was focused on mindfulness because I realized that that gave me the tool that I needed to become more self-aware. Now, I haven't gone to the degree that you have where I think it's a great idea, though, writing out those those things, right? Those those kind of pointers, the triggers, the things that are going to, you know, if you start doing these things, what it's going to lead to, and you don't want those to, and actually posting them up. I think that's a great idea. But I, because of my training and my time spent in becoming more self-aware, I, I recognize it. I, I know what the, what those signs are. And I think that's incredibly important. So maybe that is a starting point, you know, just having some time, spending time each day to become more self-aware. Absolutely. To me, the challenge is getting to the point where you can have that self-awareness. You do have to deal with what you went through and anything that is causing you to get to that point. And if you haven't done some of that, then it's really hard to be self-aware enough to say, what are my warning signs? What are the things that I need to be aware if I have that behavior, that it is a sign that I am, you know, ignoring something or, you know, going back to my normal trauma response. So getting that history off of your back, I think is the first critical step. And then being able to identify mm -hmm. The warning signs. Because for me, at least, the hard thing was I lived in those warning signs all the time. That was my everyday life. And so they were part of how I operated. It wasn't something that I thought was a bad thing. And finally coming to that realization was kind of life-changing for me. And I did uh sort of the same thing i was i was in the dark period i broke and as i was recovering i was going through the divorce and i knew i needed to go back into the workforce cuz i had become a stay at home mom for a few years and i went back and got my masters in organizational psychology and ended up writing my thesis on proactive mental health and mine was specifically in the workplace. Are there things we can do in the workplace? And I think there probably are. Um, but what I'm really passionate about right now is just explaining to people that there are things you can do and you don't have to stay in that state of, you know, a lot of people have hyper arousal. I had um, dissociation. Like there's all these different things that you can stay in and that's what I want people to understand. You don't have to be in that. And there's things that you can do. You can empower yourself to take care of it and realize that you're not alone. I mean, I you didn't say it explicitly, but I, you hinted at the fact that you felt like you had to do it. You had to do it yourself. Yeah. And there was nobody else out there. And finding those people that you can be reliant on and that you can use to help you in, in your journey. They are out there and finding them is really, really key. I like the part where you said, you know, you need to deal with the history of the problems first before we start talking about self-awareness. What were some of the things that you found were effective in you getting that part right, right? So actually getting in touch with the history of the problems. I mean, you you kind of hinted to one thing you said, you know, for some people, journaling might be a really good way to go. What were some of the things that you found worked for you effectively? So I tried just about everything um, because I'm a researcher by nature. And so when I broke, I went out and was like, all right, let's look, let's find the laundry list of things that are out there that you can try. And so I went to therapy was the first thing I did. And um, well, actually, that's not true. The first thing I did was end up going to my doctor because I couldn't eat and I couldn't sleep. And I was rapidly losing weight. I was losing, I think I lost 15 pounds in the first month and I ended up losing over 40 pounds. I'm five foot six inches and I was under a hundred pounds. 
I had, I couldn't keep pants on me. I was getting so skinny and I was, couldn't sleep, anxious, depressed, everything you can imagine. Ended up going to my doctor and being like, I simply need to sleep and I have to be able to start eating. And that was within the first couple of weeks of when I broke and he prescribed me some medications. The sleeping one helped right away. The um, anxiety and depression medication takes a while to build up in your system. So it took me a while to be able to start eating again. And uh, in that process, I realized I should probably get a therapist. So I got a therapist and it took me a bit to find the right therapist, but I did. And she helped me start talking about some of the things I was going through. But I realized that I was also really angry. And I never could figure out how to really express my anger. And that goes back to childhood. You expressed anger very physically. I suppressed it. It was, you never show that there's a problem. You keep everything inside. You don't show it. But I was really freaking pissed off, like absurd anger levels in my body. And uh, I came across the book, The Body Keeps the Score by Dr. Bessel van der, van der Kolk. And I read it and I was intrigued by it. But I was also kind of like, really? Does that, is that really true? Do you really need to physically express your emotions to release them? My initial response was, I went 50 years without doing it. I am totally fine. And that was clearly not right. So as I was going through my therapy, I, I was definitely getting better, but I could tell I still wasn't right. And I ended up talking um, with another friend of mine about this concept of physically releasing my anger. And I was I just didn't know how to do it. And she has a friend who was a social worker and became a personal trainer. And as I was telling her my idea around wanting to do this, it was kind of like the concept of a rage room or different places like that. But it was really connecting those emotions with a physical activity. So I called this woman who was the social worker turned personal trainer, and she agreed to work with me to come up with a program. And she would come over to my house with her personal training stuff. And my personal favorite was boxing. And she'd get out her mitts and I'd put my gloves on and I'd kind of lightly warm up, you know, get the body going, jog around a little bit, throw a few little light punches. And then she'd have me to start talking about whatever was pissing me off. And so I would tell her the story as I'm warming up. And as I would get more into the story, she'd have me increase my physical activity until we finally got to a phrase that kind of encapsulated whatever activity or event was pissing me off. And I'll, I won't say the exact phrase that I said, but something around you da darn jerk. And that is the PG version of it. And I would scream it and I would punch her hands as hard as I could and just physically release screaming and yelling and physically punching. And after literally just a couple of minutes, I would be in a ball on the floor crying. But it let me actually physically release that anger. And it, I ended up going back to stuff that happened when I was a, a small child because I had never actually dealt with it. And just talking about it for me was not enough. I had to have that physical release. And after I started doing that for my anger, I realized I've never really let some of this sadness go. And so I started the same thing, but I did it on my own. I sat in my car. I would drop my kids off to an activity. I would go to a dark corner of the parking lot and I would sit in my car and I had a journal that I had written some things in and I would read the journal and just start ugly crying. I mean, it was, I'm still shocked that my kids didn't notice, but it tells you just how unobservant children can be when they would get back in the car. And I, I'm like, I had tissues, I had eye drops, I had makeup so that I could re put myself together before they got back in. But still, I would look at myself and go, wow, I look like a mess. Um, because I would sit for 
sometimes 30, 40 minutes and just cry and scream and be like, why, why me? Why does, what have I done? And just let that sadness out because I had never, ever done that before. I kept everything so tightly controlled and um, I ended up stopping my in-person therapy because I found for me, after I got through that initial break and I was in therapy for a couple of years, but after I got through that, I realized that for me, I journaled better than I did um, going in and having a scheduled time to meet with somebody because things that would come up and be a problem in my life, I couldn't schedule and I couldn't keep everything waiting for that one hour that I got to spend with my therapist. And so I started writing it down and I realized for me, the light that was shed on the event as I was putting it on paper made it so much less scary and so much less impactful. It was almost like as I kept it in the dark, kind of like a scary movie, if you turn on the light, you're going to see the person hiding behind the door, which is why scary movies end up pissing me off because I'm like, um, hello, just turn on the light. You're walking through a dark house. What do you think is going to happen? It's the same thing with my emotions and my stories. If I would put it down on paper, it just shone light on it and made it something that I felt like I could deal with a little bit better. And if it got to be too much, I'd stop writing and I could walk away and I could come back to it and I could write as much as, or as little as I wanted. And those were the things that when I would then say, you know what, this, this story really pisses me off. Then I'd say, I should probably do the anger therapy that I learned how to do. And now I do it on my own because I don't have, you know, unlimited resources to hire people to come sit with me all the time. And I have a punching bag in my basement. I have a whole bunch of other things that uh, I do and I've taught my kids to do. But just a way to have that story in my head, read it from my journal or just think about it and then physically express either the anger or the sadness or whatever the emotion is. And those are the things that I did to work myself out of it. And I continue to do. But it was as I was going through that I would notice there were those triggers, those warning signs that when that would start to happen, I would realize there was something going on in my head and I would write it down. And if I wrote it down, it helped me get past that trigger and get back into kind of that happy space that I, I prefer to live in. Um, and I found that one of my warning signs was waking up in the middle of the night and ruminating about something. And I started realizing if I could get that out of my head in the middle of the night, I actually slept much better. And I have really bad handwriting. So I also learned how to voice activate the device next to my bed so that I would wake up in the middle of the night, voice activate the device, start talking to it. It would write everything down for me. I wouldn't even really have to fully wake up. As soon as I put it out, it was like, oh, okay, you can let that go because it's now safely on paper in a device somewhere. And then I could go back to sleep and the next day, wake up, read it and figure out what I need to do with it. Yeah, that's very powerful. I was There's two things I, I want to just mention there. The first thing is about that. But I think the reason why I think that's a really good strategy, and I, I'm not sure if you've had the same experience, is that when you're dealing with, you know, your 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 trauma from the past right and it's coming up and you try to figure it out or you get an idea of how to deal with it you also forget that really quickly too yes it's, it's amazing it's just it's almost like it disappears like you say oh, i got to remind myself in in a bit about what i just said to myself because that was very powerful and how to deal with this and by the time you hit the next corner it's gone which is an interesting thing. I'm sure there's somebody out there, you know, who studied this, who could tell us why that is, but that's my experience. Seems like it's yours too. So writing it down straight away, if possible, is the best possible thing you could do. So that, that was the, that was, that's a really good strategy. So one of the things with that is it does go away, but then it will come back and it will keep popping back into your mind periodically. And at least for me, until I write it down. 
Okay, so you're lucky. Mine just disappears. Well, it disappears in that instant, but then eventually it will come back. And it's like, it's gone. And I'm like, wait a minute, I had something I should remember. And then I forget about it. But then a day later, it will come back in and it will keep popping into my head until I finally deal with it. And then it's like, okay, I've gotten it out. And the faster I can get it out, the more, like the less that it will come back and pop into my head. So if I deal with it right away, then it's like, okay, I've gotten it out. It's out there. I can look back at it. Um, it's actually kind of funny. When I first started it, I had notepads next to my bed. I also wear glasses um, normally or contacts, which is what I have in right now. And But when I wake up at night and I would try and write, I would be foggy. I couldn't see. And I have these notebooks where I tried to handwrite things without being able to see. And I'm telling you, it looks like a two-year-old was writing their journal. And I'm like, wow, what was it I was trying to say? So that's the other reason for wanting to use the electronic device. <laughs> yeah. The second thing was, was you, I think you don't understand how lucky you were to have met somebody who was a social worker and then became a personal trainer and then used boxing as a way for you to deal with these things because i get asked all the time you know as somebody who teaches martial arts like you know do you think it's a really good thing for me to do especially from a therapeutic standpoint and help me deal with my mental health and often i say uh, no and the reason i say no is because if you went to typically one of these kind of modern martial art experiences where they're doing these kinds of things especially for guys and i'm sure it's the same for women but i know for guys for sure you do you do the training, but you never allow to show yes. vulnerability. You don't connect the emotion with the physical. It's that connection that has to be made. And I I will say, and I I have a book, and in the book I say one of my top five decisions in my life was calling that woman that was the social worker turned personal trainer because it completely changed the trajectory of my life. It completely changed it. And I am beyond grateful that I, you know, serendipity of having that happen is absolutely, you're right. I am one of the luckiest people in the world that that actually happened. Yeah, because so many people I see training in the modern martial arts experience, but actually what I see is it's actually negative for them. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's negative is, as I said, because the, especially for guys, the boy code is in effect. And you're not allowed to show any vulnerability. You're not allowed to show any weakness. You just need to take it. So basically, you never get to that point where it actually becomes a therapeutic process. It has the potential, as you realized. And I think because she wasn't, quote unquote, a trained full-time martial arts instructor, you were able to circumvent that problem. And that's a really good thing. Yes. And and it's funny. We did some other things as well. Um one time I, she gave me a medicine ball to throw down and just get, throw it harder and harder and harder and just try and get the, you know, stress out that way. And I literally threw it down so hard that it bounced back up and hit me in the face. And she was like, I've never seen a medicine ball bounce. <laughs> like, well, that's how much anger I had. That is literally how much anger I had. It rebounded off of the floor and hit me in the face, which... Yeah, that that shows you exactly how much I was I was carrying inside me. But I agree. I, there's so many physical activities that we do that are really great for our physical health. But that doesn't mean that it's helping us mentally. And most of them have the potential. But you have to make that connection. You have to put those two and you have to do it mindfully to your you know, point earlier of you have to not just go in and be like, oh yeah, I'm going to think about it today. No, no, no. It really has to be very top of mind. You have to be very present in that concept of what am I thinking about and how can my body really let that flow through and exit and not have as much weight in my, my everyday life. Yeah, that's a very important point. So as we start coming to the end, Janet, what I want to do at this point, let's, let's talk about your book. Because coming out of everything you've been talking about, that was the thing that came forward, right? Writing mm -hmm. that book. I mean, and congratulations. So thank that, you. I know what it's like to write a book, not an easy task. 
Tell us about your book. So I have to tell you the process a little bit um, because it happened in a way that I could have never foreseen. I'm not a writer. It was not ever my intent to write a book. And after I went through this and I did all of this process and I got my degree, um, I was like, I don't know what I want to do. And uh, I ended up talking with this woman who is a uh, career coach. And I told her this whole story, a lot of the stuff that I told you. And we get to the end of this free two-hour session that she gave me. And she said, I think you have a book in you. And I went, no, I don't. <laughs> That's so funny. Thanks so much. And then I left that meeting with her and it just kind of stayed in my head. And I was like, huh, maybe I do actually have a book in me. And we ended up, I ended up working with her for a long time. I still work with her. And she said, well, I have somebody I think you should talk to. And she put me in touch with um, a, this publisher and this editor and they did a um, another free, actually like 30 minute workshop with me to like, just talk about this concept of a book. And we got done with it. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I think I really do have a book in me. And so I, uh, we agreed to work together and I wrote that book in four weeks. Wow. It was inside me and it was, it came out so easily. The editing process and the publishing process was a lot more strenuous and going back and reworking and all of that. Um, but the initial part of just having it come out was actually way easier than I would have thought because I am really, really passionate about it. And I really wanted to t tell people about this, this concept. And as I talk with people about it, I realize nobody has really heard this. A lot of people have read The Body Keeps the Score. Some people have talked about it, but I've never heard anybody say, what do you do with that? If you don't have PTSD as a war veteran, which is who he worked with primarily, what can you do with it? And I was like, I found something that worked. I don't know that it works for everybody. I'm not saying that it does, but everybody that I've talked to about it and have worked with people, it has been really helpful for them to make this connection and to actually do something. Um, so I wrote Stop the Break, um, which actually just came out uh, February 15th. And I am one very proud of myself that I actually did it. But the reason why I did it was to get the information out to people. And then my goal is to actually be able to go and talk to more people about it, whether it's personally, if it's on a podcast, if it's you know going and giving a speech somewhere or doing workshops with people, just to try and get people to understand that you can be proactive with your mental health, that asking for help is not a sign of a weakness, that there's many people that have been through this, that you're not alone. And all of that, I hope, comes out in my book. Absolutely. So what I'll do is in the show notes, I'll put a link so people can find your book and where they can get it, you know, locally. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Janet, that was, that was amazing. I loved it. Thanks for being a guest. Thank you. I have to say, I feel like, you know, we are very kindred spirits in what we went through, even though I would say our life experiences are probably extraordinarily different. They're mm -hmm. also the same. And I feel like that is true of so many people that I have talked with about this, that when you start being this open and this vulnerable with your life, that you find so many more people like you that have gone through these things and realize there are th so many options for people to make it a much better life for themselves and that they can take charge of their life. And I love the message that you are bringing to everybody. So thank you so much for having me be part of it. To learn more about the art of self-reliance, our virtual coaching service, online courses, and our retreats in Thailand, head over to Primal Skills. That's with a Z.com.